Thank you. And uh, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me too. Uh, so, in 1748, the 24 year old heiress Elizabeth Jeffreys wrote to the barrister Charles Pratt to describe the intensity of her feelings for him. She rhapsodized how my love engrosses all my time and thoughts. I take no pleasures in anything but thinking on you and hearing from you. Writing, I esteem one now, though it was formerly my aversion. But as you tell me it gives you pleasure, it becomes the same to me. I only wish I had a more fruitful brain to vary as you do my expressions in giving you proofs how much I love you. Her fiance was equally enamored and he mused the following year, I found love ever since I knew anything of it to be the most mysterious passion of the mind and almost perpetually clashing, pardon me this blasphemy with reason. This love is the bond of all society and production of all the good in this world. So love in 18th century England was understood as a mysterious and intangible passion of the mind, uh, which often found itself uh, very much at odds with reason. It was an all-encompassing emotion uh, which could take over a person's whole being. Uh, so Charles was the son of the Lord Chief Justice, uh, and he'd recently been admitted to Middle Temple himself. His fiancée, Elizabeth, was a gentleman's daughter, and she was the heiress of Brecon Priory in Wales. So this was very much an advantageous match for both of them. Nonetheless, it was the experience of love that they used to give structure and meaning to their relationship as they advanced towards an anticipated matrimony. Uh, so in this talk today, uh, hopefully, uh, I aim to reveal how love was understood, valued, and enacted by couples engaging in courtship in Georgian England. Uh, and so more broadly, it shows how the significance, performance, and experience of emotions, such as love, changes between cultures and over time. Uh, love emerges not as a static entity or a universal human experience, uh, but something that we do in practice. Love is a verb, uh, something that we do through particularly, particular socially and historically determined rituals. So to give you some context, uh, this research arises from my book, The Game of Love in Georgian England, uh, which will be available in all good bookshops uh, from January. <laughs> uh, so the book uh, recreates the emotional experience of courtship, the celebrated game of love, uh, using the words and objects chosen by men and women to navigate their relationships. Uh, it draws upon 60 courtships between a wide range of ordinary men and women, including servants, wheelwrights, ironmongers, soldiers, sailors, merchants, clergymen, lawyers, gentlemen, and gentlemen's daughters. Evidence of these relationships has been preserved in 30 archives and museum collections, in letters, diaries, memoirs, poems, periodicals, newspaper reports, and court cases. Further important evidence comes from objects, such as garters, gloves, locks of hair, miniature portraits, rings, snuff boxes, and Valentine cards. The book uses this evidence to explore how courting practices actively cultivated particular feelings and the particular languages and rituals that couples used in falling in and out of love. Uh, so to begin with, what is love? Uh, so biological anthropologists such as Helen Fisher have argued that romantic love is a universal human experience that is woven firmly into the fabric of the human brain. Uh, and so Fisher used brain scans of individuals who had recently fallen in love as they gazed at a photograph of their beloved uh, in order to isolate its defining characteristics. Uh, and she found that love is characterized by several distinct traits, including mood swings, emotional dependence on a person, hypersensitivity to their words and actions, sexual possessiveness, and obsessive thoughts about their charms. These create elevated activity of dopamine in the brain, similar to the feeling generated by a rush of cocaine. Uh, and such research uh, suggests that love isn't an emotion, but a basic human drive, such as hunger or thirst, uh, which is located in the craving part of the mind. Um, and Helen Fisher and her colleague, the neuroscientist Lucy Brown, uh, have a website called theanatomyoflove.com. Uh, and on it, you can go on a tour of the brain in love uh, that's conducted by a robot called Cupod. Uh, but... Uh, there are really big problems for historians here uh, in fixing these static features of love that are unchanging for all people in all cultures and all time periods. 
Uh, so if love is really woven into the fabric of the brain, uh, is it therefore feasible to say that a medieval troubadour experience love in exactly the same way as an 18th century man of feeling or a millennial today? Surely not. Uh, so historians have found, for example, that troubadours in the 12th century could yawn as a way to show their long devotion for a beloved, while suitors in the 17th century might break into a cold sweat at the onset of love and subsequently experience itching veins, burning bowels and liver problems. But today, this means something totally different. I mean, you'd probably think you had food poisoning or something, you know, if you had these symptoms, not love. Um, and so research in the history of emotions is working to bridge this gap between the internal neurochemical experience of emotions and their external bodily expression, whether through yawning or itching. Uh, as Monique Scheer has persuasively argued, emotional arousals that seem like they're purely physical are actually deeply socialized as socially and historically situated actions of a knowing or mindful body. Love isn't generally included in lists of the basic emotions created as a result of evolution, uh, generally uh, including anger, fear, sadness, enjoyment, disgust, and surprise. Uh, psychologists such as Paul Ekman, I'm not going to go on a rant like Fraser said, <laughs> uh, again argue that love is not an emotion at all uh, since it doesn't have a unique universal facial expression and is more long lasting, lasting months or years or a lifetime rather than seconds or minutes. Uh, rather, love is an emotion plot, which is always connected with something in the world. So love always has a direct object. In other words, a person in love has to be in love with someone. You can't just be in love generally uh, or be, feel a little bit in love in the same way that you might feel a little bit sad or a bit angry. Uh, psychologists studying the semantics of love have likewise presented it as part of a constellation of feelings experienced in romantic relationships, which either derive from happiness or constitute a separate category comprised of affection, lust, and longing. So couples in Georgian England did describe this kind of constellation of emotions, uh, ranging from the piercing thorns of pain, uh, kind of the kind of heartbreak of love, uh, to the bright state of excitement when they were anticipating marriage. So how was love understood in Georgian England? So love was seen as a long-lasting and intangible passion uh, and celebrated as an almost spiritual experience that went beyond words. In 1723, the poet Judith Cooper described her love for Captain Martin Madan as so strong, so soft a passion mixed with so much of an awful regard. Uh, and so a woman's love in particular was seen as soft and delicate, with the philosopher Bernard Mandeville arguing that women could not relish the coarsest food of love unless it had been seasoned with that obliging softness and anxious regard uh, in which the delicacy of the passion consists. In the second half of the century, increasingly the cult of sensibility encouraged men to examine the many different facets of their love in order to emphasise their emotional tenderness and delicacy of feeling. In 1779, the gentleman John Eccles wrote to the novelist Mary Hayes, asking, but what is love and how is it produced? He concluded, it is a passion that raises in the breast sensations most refined, a complacency replete with delight. With love increasingly presented as a tender and refined sensation, the philosopher Mary Wollstonecraft wrote in 1796 that love was an affair of sentiment, arising from the same delicacy of perception or good taste that enabled people to appreciate the beauties of nature and poetry. Uh, and so the term emotions was only very, very rarely used by writers uh, to describe a very general emotion towards something, a very general feeling, uh, like emotions of approbation towards a suitor or a mixed emotion uh, at continuing your relationship despite parental opposition. The 18th century saw a new celebration of romantic love in literature, philosophy and art. So in literature, notions of an ideal married love as the reward for virtue were popularized in epistolary novels such as Samuel Richardson's best-selling Pamela. In philosophical treatises such as Rousseau's Emile, published in 1762, love before marriage was presented as the law of nature, with the main duty of married couples such as Emile and Sophie being to love each other. Sentimental artworks created idealized scenes of rural courtship, 
with Henry Singleton's painting displayed here, showing a farmer courting an industrious woman who sits beside her spinning wheel. The conversation piece also emerged as a new genre in the 1720s and 30s, celebrating the affection between married couples and the intimacy and closeness of their family unit. Uh, as in the example here, uh, it typically depicts a family in an informal setting, uh, kind of talking with, other, uh, talking with one another, taking tea, uh, and engaging in everyday activities like horse riding. So the anthropologist William Reddy has argued that loving marriages became an important emotional refuge during this period, uh, and a kind of space where men and women could let down their guard uh, and find safe relief from usual emotional norms. Uh, so rather than being seen as a dangerous passion that was fundamentally incompatible with marriage, love became its proper foundation. Uh, marriage for love became an important ideal to strive for uh, that produced its own morality independent of God. As Ruth Block argues in her study of 18th century America, sex in the context of courtship and marriage had come to be seen as a conduit to a higher morality beyond the physical and profane, as romantic love was transformed into a civilizing and stabilizing force. Companionate marriages were one of the key features seen to distinguish enlightened Europeans from their savage counterparts. As the Scottish philosopher and historian John Miller wrote in The Origin of the Distinction of the Ranks, published in 1779, he said, a savage is seldom or never determined to marry from the particular inclinations of sex, but commonly enters into that connection when he arrives at an age and finds himself in circumstances which render the acquisition of a family expedient or necessary to his comfortable subsistence. He discovers no preference of any particular woman, but leaves it to his parents or other relations to make choice of a person whom it is thought proper that he should marry. Uh, but of course, there are a wide range of factors that also led men and women in Georgian England to marry, apart from love, uh, as satirized in this print uh, called Matrimonial Speculation. Uh, so you can see the woman top left, she's primarily concerned about status, and she decides that this guy is a good subject for keeping up the family title. Uh, to their right, a short man selects a tall woman to marry, uh, declaring, I'll have her, she'll improve the regiment. Uh, and then the couple on the far right of the top row are marrying because she's pregnant. Uh, and so she says, never mind, John, it may be all for the best. And then he replies, if it does, I'll be damned. Uh, bottom right, the man selects a rich old woman to be mar to marry, uh, guessing in all human probability she cannot exist a fortnight. Uh, and the man second from the left on the bottom row decides she will be a great addition to the shop. Uh, so you can see, uh, kind of very generally speaking, uh, people selected partners of a similar age, rank, fortune, religion, and disposition. But even given this, uh, the majority of couples still saw themselves as being in hot pursuit of love, uh, particularly the distinct experience of falling in love and remaining thereafter in love. So what did it mean to be in love? Uh, so being in love, I think, was a very distinct emotional experience, uh, characterized by a range of different feelings, uh, including happiness, comfort, excitement, joy, and desire, but also at the same time, anxiety, jealousy, fear, unease, and pain. Uh, and among these, I think happiness was one of the most important. Uh, so historians have shown how happiness increasingly replaced the term felicity from the 16th century uh, and changed in meaning, uh, from just meaning kind of good fortune or good luck to a subjective state of well-being. Uh, so happiness thus became something that you could find or have individually uh, and increasingly found its way into the language of ordinary people over the 17th and 18th centuries. So when the domestic servant, Elizabeth Woolat, received a proposal of marriage in 1755, her employer urged her to consult her own happiness in deciding whether or not to accept, and even offered to make her independent in order to prevent her having to marry for any motive other than love. As Elizabeth wrote to her suitor, the wheelwright Jedediah Strutt, love was essential to the most lasting, most perfect happiness, and she hoped to meet with proper returns of affection from the person I love, believing that in these circumstances, no one could be more happy than myself. 
An essential part of marrying was to find love and produce children, thereby obtaining happiness. Uh, and so the print shown here is titled Happiness and depicts a loving married couple with their child. And the text below reads, Happy they live by Hymen blessed, the god of love their vows caressed, in hopes their happier hours to share may be our greatest, chiefest care. Love was manifested physically through symptoms such as blushing, sighing, trembling, weeping, and dreaming about a loved one. Uh, the print here on the left is part of a series satirizing modern social graces. Uh, it shows a woman theatrically fainting with a print of, uh, painting of her lover around her neck. Uh, and on the right, you've got two lovers melodramatically weeping over romantic novels using oversized handkerchiefs in order to showcase their refinement. Uh, and so in addition to the changing physicality of love, the language of love evolved too. The concept of falling in love was still quite novel during the 18th century. As the chaplain's daughter, Anne Temple, wrote to a friend from Cornwall in 1792, Mr. Boswell is a curious genius too. He's perpetually falling in love, as he calls it. Uh, and then he can do nothing but talk of the angelic creature. To make love to another person meant to declare your passion, separate from the physical act of making love as we now understand it. Romantic language also evolved with scientific advances to describe the chemistry between two people and their connection as a kind of electricity or spark. So the way that we understand, value, enact, and experience love changes over time and is historically and culturally specific. There is no hard and fast opposition between real or authentic internal emotions and their outer bodily expression, as the body, in its particular social and environmental context, thinks along with the brain. So following this theory, love can be viewed as a cultural practice, as something that we do. So how did people do love in 18th century England? So material objects... Oopsie, I'll go back. Material objects such as love tokens played a fundamental role in eliciting and concretizing the experience of love. Uh, meditating upon tokens, as in this print here, uh, stimulated loving thoughts of the absent uh, and encouraged the development of intimacy. As the Bedfordshire gentleman Samuel Whitbread wrote to his future wife Elizabeth Gray in 1787, the more I think upon, the more amiable I find you and the more I love you. Samuel sent boxes full of trinkets to his sweetheart, including earrings from Paris and gloves from Montpellier, recognizing, I cannot find words that keep pace with my feelings. Objects provided a means of doing so and were continually touched, kissed, smelled, gazed upon, carried around, and used as vehicles to strengthen a couple's attachment. William Ward's Mezzotint, The Pledge of Love, depicts a fashionable gentlewoman sitting beneath a tree, holding a folded love letter in her right hand. And she's totally absorbed in this process of looking at a miniature that's suspended on a ribbon around her neck. Uh, and the inscription reads, the lovely fair with rapture views this token of their love, then all her promises renews and hopes he'll constant prove. So lovers were expected to gaze at silhouettes and miniature portraits at length while remembering their beloved's physical qualities, imagining the rapture of being with them and renewing the promises that brought them together. The Norfolk Justice of the Peace, Anthony Hammond, described this process of reading love letters from his sweetheart, Mary Ann Musters, in 1828, writing, if I'm cold and wet, I do not open them until I'm comfortably settled in the great chair I'm writing in, and then I devour them. I'm sure I shall wear out that dear lock of hair if I stay much longer from you. He also described how, I'll read a chapter of the Bible, uh, say a prayer for my dear Mary Ann, kiss her dear lock of hair, and wish her good night, and will also give her a little advice not to fidget herself and to take a quiet ride every day. Uh, and so these extracts suggest that writers touched and kissed letters and tokens to create the sensation that they were together, uh, allowing the tactile distance between them to be bridged. So the exchange, assembly, and use of tokens created new forms of behavior among individuals who surrounded themselves with romantic gifts. As Sarah Ahmed has argued, by enveloping ourselves with highly valued, valued objects, we create a near sphere or horizon of likes, uh, comprising carefully chosen things that we wish to have, touch, taste, hear, feel, and see around us, which then take up residence within our bodily horizon. 
Uh, and so the ritualized process of handling love tokens is satirized here in Isaac Cruikshank searching the illustrious lover. Uh, and it ridicules the Duke of Cumberland, who isolates himself with a chest full of keepsakes uh, to celebrate his love for Mrs. Powell. Uh, and in his kind of distracted monologue, he describes how I talk in my sleep. In short, I act the part of a fool. Oh, the dear plant, the dear, the ever dear pink cotton, my charmer, my dearest dear, my adored, my celestial. I've invoked Cupid, Mercury, Mars, Saturn, Venus, and all the deities to sanction our heaven-born love. Uh, and so he's holding a red ribbon belonging to Mrs. Powell to his mouth, uh, using its scent to fuel his fantasies about her. Uh, meanwhile, the phallic watering can in his lap is spouting water all over the table, uh, kind of fueling his desire. Uh, and so I think it very much reinforces the haptic power of assembled objects in stirring loving thoughts, acting as material sites of romantic emotion. So to conclude... Uh, I've argued that the language of love changes over time, as do the, does the value that we attach to love and the ways in which we physically express and experience it. This view of love as a cultural practice, as something that we do, I think is encapsulated uh, in this series called The Progress of Love, uh, which was based on paintings by Francis Wheatley and George Morland uh, and was engraved and published by John Dean in 1787. Uh, so in the first one, uh, a young man offers a woman some ribbons for the fair uh, as a token on Valentine's Day. In the second, she succumbs to her feelings for him uh, and is languishing in bed from lovesickness. In the third instalment, the couple marry. And in the fourth, they have a baby, they have their own household, and they're a happy family. In some, the progress of love is intimately connected to the progression of history uh, and with the culture and time period that we're living in. Thank you.